Welcome to Mariner's Church. We are so glad that you're worshiping with us today. Wherever you are, let's begin to prepare our hearts to experience the presence of God. Let's worship together.
never been, there'll never be another like you. There's never been.
Praise God, and in a moment, we're going to continue our service. But before we do, I want to invite you into a few ways that you can be a part of what God is doing in our church. And to do that, I invited my friend Johan, who serves as the discipleship pastor at our North Irvine congregation. Thanks, Paul. One of my favorite things about serving at North Irvine is seeing the Spirit of God move in the lives of our people, bringing healing, strength, and joy. And one of the most exciting times for us is seeing when the Holy Spirit convicts and brings people into the family of God on our I Believe weekends. We had one recently for the Rooted Celebration weekend, and my goodness, was it a time of celebration, celebrating that I believe. Mm, that's amazing, Johan. And actually, right now, we have over 20 people going through our New Believers class online where they're learning how to step into their new life with Jesus. And that's because of your generosity. We're able to serve wherever these people are at in their faith journey. And so thank you for partnering with us to inspire people to follow Jesus and fearlessly change the world. And if you're not already, I wanna invite you to be a part of what God is doing in our church through your generosity. That is so good. Another way we want to invite you to be a part of what God is doing is by inviting your friends, family, coworkers, neighbors, and Uncle Bob to worship with you. In two weeks, all of our congregations, including North Irvine and online, are kicking off with the second part of our two-part series on the Holy Spirit called The Spirit in You. This will be a great time for someone to check out our church whether online or in person. It's been such a good series, and so I hope you invite. And in addition to giving and inviting, we want you to be a part of what our church is doing by taking your next step into community and serving. And so if you wanna learn more about what that looks like at Mariners, I wanna invite you, fill out a Connect card, which you can do at the link below. We hope that you will be a part of what God is doing to inspire people to follow Jesus and fearlessly change the world Let's continue to worship together. One of the greatest gifts that you gave to me as your pastor was the opportunity to take a study break. I'd be able to get away and pray about the next year and plan all of what God would want for us for the next season of the church. And it would give me a chance to be with my family. I got to be, ref I just got refreshed. And I am so excited that you have continued on in that gift and that we give that gift to Eric. I spoke to him this week and he is so excited. He has planned out the whole next year as far as what God wants to teach us. He's excited, he's refreshed, and he's gonna be coming back. In fact, in a couple of weeks, he's gonna begin the second half of the series that we're in on the Holy Spirit. And he's gonna talk about how he equips us and empowers us and calls us to ministry. So you wanna be a part of that. You know, one of the things that I don't think I, I've ever understood, I'm not sure I will ever understand, it is this, that God wants a relationship with me. It just amazes me. And it's not just a relationship. He, he actually wants to be my friend. He wants to have a relationship where it's encouraging and loving and I feel affirmed by him that I know him. I'm gonna read a verse to you. And this verse is one of the most famous verses in the Bible. And when I read it, there's actually a picture that will come to your mind that I'm sure you've seen before because it's that famous. Look what it says. Look, and it's Jesus speaking. I stand at the door, talking about the door of your heart, and knock. And if you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Here, Jesus says, I'm not going to push my way in. I'm not going to knock the door down. I'm not going to come in uninvited. But this unique truth to Christianity and to Jesus is that he wants to spend time with us as his friend. Uh, and it's an amazing thing, just that he wants to and enjoy a friendship with us. And that's what we're gonna talk about because really it's the Holy Spirit that provides the way that we have that because the Holy Spirit is both our teacher 
and our guide. And that's what we want to talk about in the passages that we're looking at this morning. Uh, the thing that what I want you to see is the Holy Spirit guides and teaches us. And so we're going to see what the Bible says about that, how that happens specifically, and then what we can do to really make that a part of our life. And this is a great passion in my life. If there's anything that I want for you, is that you would be someone that hears God's voice, that you're confident that you know his voice and that you follow him. Look at what Jesus said in John 10. My sheep, listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. And I've seen this happen in Israel so many times. You'll see two shepherds walk together and their flocks just intermix. And you think you're never gonna be able to untangle that mess. But when they're done talking, they go their separate ways and one begins to sing or one calls out and immediately the sheep know the voice of their shepherd and they follow them. And that's what this is talking about, that Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, you know it, and they follow me. And that's really my goal for you, that you would know God's voice and you would be able to follow him. So we're gonna look at three passages where we see that the Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us and he guides us He's the one who communicates to us. Look at what it says first in John 16, 13 through 15. And Jesus has just said in this passage what we've, where we started this series, where he says, it's better that I go and that I leave so that the Holy Spirit can come and live inside of you so that he can be with you 24 seven, all the time, everywhere you go, it's better. And then Jesus said, when the spirit of truth comes, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future and he will bring glory to me. First, it says that he's gonna guide us into all truth. And so when the Holy Spirit speaks, he has one goal, to tell us about Jesus, his love for us, to teach us what Jesus has taught so that we learn how to live our life, the purpose for our life, the meaning of our life. Uh, he wants us to know Jesus. That's his whole goal. And he says when he comes, he'll tell us about the future. And we see examples of that in the Bible. In the book of Acts, Holy Spirit telling what's going to happen. To the John, the whole book of Revelation is the Holy Spirit telling what's going to happen in the future. And then the Holy Spirit, it says, will bring Jesus glory. So everything that the Holy Spirit does is Jesus-centric. It's always focused on Jesus. So first thing it does, he's gonna teach us all truth. And then look at what it says in John 14, 26. But when the Father sends the advocate, that's the Holy Spirit, one who stands on our behalf in our defense as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you. And you know what's amazing is when you hold your Bible, you have an illustration of this truth because that's what the Holy Spirit did. The Holy Spirit inspired and moved the writers to, to write down what God wanted for us. Really, it was the Holy Spirit who constructed God's word and gave us truths that are in, you know, that were written in time, but they're written by all these different authors. But what's amazing is that it contains principles and truth that have lasted thousands of years. It speaks to every people at every time, to all cultures, all languages. The, the Holy Spirit has spent a huge amount of energy to give us the Bible that gives us God's truth, that teaches us about Jesus. And that's why what we'll see is that when the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us, he's gonna use the Bible to speak to us in very powerful ways. And then in 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 2.10, it says, for it is the Spirit who searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. And we have received God's Spirit not the world spirit, so we can know the wonderful things that God has freely given us. So just stop there for a second because just think about what he's saying there. In this passage, it says essentially, you know, the Holy Spirit's our teacher and it doesn't depend on our IQ or our brilliance or our educational standard. Doesn't matter that you got a C in chemistry and you think, oh, I'm not gonna understand something that the Holy Spirit wants to teach me. The Holy Spirit knows all the wisdom of God is what this passage says. And not only that, he knows you. And so the Holy Spirit is your teacher and he's going to teach you, it says, so we can know. We can know these secret things of God. We can know, it says, the wonderful things that God has freely given us. And I love this because what it means is there isn't any truth that God has for you 
you're not gonna learn. There's nothing that you can't understand. There isn't some secret that you won't get. The Holy Spirit's gonna deliver the deep secrets of God. He's gonna teach you the what You can know the wonderful things about all the things that God has freely given us. And then he goes on and he says, and we know the wonderful things that God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Holy Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. But people who are not spiritual, they can't receive these truths from the Spirit of God. It all sounds like foolish to the, foolishness to them. And they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Here, what he's saying again is the Spirit teaches us. And here's what I love about this passage. The Spirit isn't limited by the teacher. And so God's Spirit speaks directly to your spirit. And so what God does is he takes the words that I'm speaking right now and he supercharges them. He supernaturally blesses them and he speaks to your heart through his spirit. And so it's not my cleverness, it's not the teacher's ability that limits what the Holy Spirit's doing. I mean, God is our teacher. And so the things that we need to know is not limited because it's spirit to spirit. So there's a supernatural tra transaction that's going on right now. And if you are learning something, if you are moved by something, if you have a sense that God has spoken to you, that is the spirit of God who's speaking spirit to spirit his spirit to your spirit so that you can know. And I love this because these truths are awesome. It means there isn't anything that God has for you that you won't know. The Holy Spirit's your teacher and he's gonna teach you. You can know all the wonderful things and the secrets about God. And it's not limited by our ability or our brilliance or our background. And that he, the Holy Spirit is gonna create this supernatural transaction and teach us the very things that we need to know. And we can see the stories of this happening in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the actions of the first disciples as they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so we get to see how the Holy Spirit does this. He teaches and guides. In the very first story in the book of Acts, Jesus tells the disciples, he says, I want you to stay in Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit comes down and is given to all the believers. And so on the opening day of the church, look at the first message that God sort of shouts to the world. It wasn't to just one ethnic group and it wasn't a private faith. It was out loud, big and in public. And it was to every culture, every ethnic group, every language, to all people. Everyone was included day one in the church. That's a part of what the church is. And then Peter, you see, who is guided by the Holy Spirit and has been taught by the Holy Spirit. And now the Holy Spirit reminds him of everything that Jesus has taught him. So he's able to stand up right outside the, the, ste the temple steps in Jerusalem. And he preaches a great message that the Holy Spirit leads him and teaches him in. And 3000 people come to Jesus. And when you read the book of Acts, that's the story. It's the story of the Holy Spirit leading his people and teaching his people, guiding his people. And so we get to see all the acts of the disciples. So now the question is then, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, is it an audible voice? Do you hear words? I mean, how does it work? And I want you to understand it because we have to be crystal clear on it. When, when I speak to you, I speak using words. And so I take an idea, a thought that's in my spirit. I put it in words. You hear those words, then you deconstruct those words in the meaning, and then you begin to put it into your spirit. But when you think about it, words are a pretty clumsy way to speak. In fact, we know that nonverbal is actually very effective and even more powerful. So Lori, if I do something that displeases her without saying a word, <laughs> she can give me a look. And it's like, do you really want to do that? Is sort of what, you know, she says, or if I'm doing something where I'm insensitive or unkind, I mean, she can give me a look with just a, and I mean, she communicates volumes. What God does is he uses the most direct form of communication, his spirit to our spirit. So God's spirit speaks directly to our spirit. And when he does, we understand. And so he guides us, he leads us, uh, he teaches us. And so Christians use words like this. And they're kind of clumsy words, but this is what it means. It says, I felt led by the Holy Spirit. 
or I was nudged by the Holy Spirit. I was affirmed by the Holy Spirit to move in this direction. I felt called to go in this direction by the Holy Spirit or by God. God said to me, or God highlighted to me, or Jesus led me. All of these terms are the same words for what it means for God's Spirit to speak to our spirit. And when it happens, we understand it. And that's why Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, they know me, and they follow me. And so we know. So the most important skill is that we need to learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit. So how is the Holy Spirit going to speak to you? <clears throat> you need to understand that. Now, I'm going to tell you the five ways that the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And these are not unique to me. In fact, if you went to ever any gospel-believing church in America today and said, how does God speak? They would say, here's the five ways God speaks, five ways. If you went to any, any country in the world, any church that was gospel-centered, believe the Bible, they would teach you the same five things. And if you went back in time, 100 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, this is truth that the church has taught for 2,000 years. This is how God's Spirit speaks, how He teaches, how He guides, five ways. Through His Word, through the Bible, through prayer, through the Holy Spirit, uh, through God's community as God's family gathers together and through circumstances. That's the five ways that God speaks. Got it? Through his word, prayer, through, what's the third one? Through the Holy Spirit, through godly community, and then through circumstances. So we're just going to look at those. This, this is a way that the Holy, this is how the Holy Spirit speaks to us. First way is through God's word. God inspired the Bible. The Bible tells us that he moved authors to write and he constructed it and putting into the Bible the principles, the truths, the things that we need to know that have proven valuable over thousands of years to every culture, every language, language every people group. And if you think that God you know, took that much effort to put together the Bible, you know he's going to use it to speak to you really clearly, very powerfully. That's why David wrote in Psalm 119, your word is a lamp to guide my feet. It is a light to my path. Or Paul wrote in 2, Corinthians, in 2 Timothy 3, he said, all scripture is inspired by God. It's useful really to teach us the way to go. It corrects us when we are going the wrong way. It teaches us to do what is right. And God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So God's word is given to us to equip and to prepare us for every good work. You know, in all of our lives, every day of our life, we are facing huge decisions. And here's the greatest thing. God actually knows where your life is going. He knows the decisions that you're going to have to make in the future. The decisions that are about your vocation and your career, about dating and marriage, about raising children, about finances, about housing, where you should live, about your morals and ethics. And so the Holy Spirit wants you to know, you know, he wants to prepare you for all of these big decisions that are coming your way. And so he's given us his word. And when we spend time in God's word, he prepares us. He shows us what Jesus taught and how we need to think about life and truth, how we need to be loving people and how that is such an important priority in our life. What we need to think about marriage, what we need to think about kids, what we think about finances. I mean, when we read God's word, it is the truth of God that's preparing us and teaching us how to think and how to live and how to make decisions. I mean, how are you going to make decisions when you come to the most important moments in your life? Go to what's easiest. You're going to flip a coin. You're going to do a T-chart and look at pros and cons. You're going to say, oh, God, just, you know, do red shirt, green shirt, which shirt should I wear? You know, God wants us to grow and be prepared to make the most important decisions in our life. And God will never violate his word. As a pastor, I can't tell you how many times people have come to me and said absolutely ridiculous things. Not this exactly, but this is what it sounds like when I hear it. God led me to take something that doesn't belong to me because he wants me to be happy. So what would you say to that? What I say is you just made that up. God had nothing to do with that because God would never lead you to do something. The Holy Spirit would never lead you to do something contrary to his word. And I know every time I talk to people about, you just gotta spend time in, your, in the Bible. 
They go, oh, it's just so hard. It's hard to find time. I'll tell you what's hard. I, what's hard is to face all the decisions that you're gonna face over your life, even over the next month, without the clarity of God's word, the, principle, the principles that God's given about his love and his encouragement in your life, the truth that you need to make the decisions. I mean, without that perspective, how to think, how to life, I mean, the lack of clarity, uh, the loss of hope, I mean, that's what's hard. I'll tell you what's easy, to spend a few minutes every day into God's word so that you understand how to live and how to think, and you have the Holy Spirit speaking you, training you, so that you're able to make the decisions that you need to make. That's what's easy. I read a study that was fascinating to me. And what they did in this study is they, they um, interviewed people and they gave them a test to determine what their worldview was. And if they were a conservative person, what they did is they offered to pay them for three months to watch a more liberal uh, news outlet. And if they were a liberal person, they paid them to watch a more conservative news outlet. And they did it for three months. And do you know what they discovered? In just three months time, people changed their worldview by watching a different news outlet. Who do you want to determine your worldview? You want a news outlet to determine how you're gonna view life? Or do you want the Spirit of God using His Word as you read it to give you a worldview about God's wonderful kindness and love and His grace and a way of living that brings life to, the, to you and to this world? I mean, we want God's word to determine how we view life. And so that's what he says. So the first way that God speaks is through his word. The second word, way that God speaks is through prayer. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. What's prayer? It's telling God what you need. It's just talking to God and thank him for what he has done. And then you will experience peace. And so when you just talk to God, you tell him about the events in your life, you say, God, I'm facing these, I need your help. I mean, just talking to God is a way that the Holy Spirit speaks to us, the riches of God's word and prayer. There was a young man who got caught and he ended up in jail. He called his mom with his one phone call and said, mom, I need $500 for bail. And so she sent over a Bible and in it, a note, she said, pray and read your Bible. The, the son was so irritated at his mom. She would, he didn't even call her for like three days. And he just sat in jail, called him at three days. And she said, son, did you pray and read your Bible? Again, he was so mad, he just hung up. He ended up staying in jail for about two weeks. He met with, when the thing got figured out, his mom showed up to pick him up out of jail. And he goes, mom, why didn't you just send me the $500? She says, do you have the Bible I sent? He said, yeah, she opened it up and inside of the Bible was taped $500. And she says, next time, read your Bible and pray. See, first two things. That's how God's gonna work in your life. The third way is that it's the Holy Spirit literally speaks to us. He speaks to our spirit in that very direct way. Look at what it says in Romans eight. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. You received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. And now we call him Abba Father, Daddy. We have a personal relationship, a close one, for his spirit joins with our spirit. God's spirit joins with our spirit and affirms every day that we are God's loved children. So when you tell the story of your life, what God wants is for you to say, I did this because I was led by the Spirit. I was prompted by the Spirit. I was nudged by the Spirit. I felt like God guided me as I spent time with Him. Uh, I heard His voice. I mean, that is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We hear His voice. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. They know me and they follow me. So God's Spirit speaks powerfully directly to our spirit. And then the fourth way is through godly community. Now this one is probably the most challenging for Americans because as Americans, we think much more individualistic. And this is really where the global church teaches so much to the American church. Uh, and the first church, I mean, if you look at the first church, every time they faced a decision that was important, they just gathered together. And when we go with our global partners, I mean, that's what they do. They are always gathering. If you have a big decision, 
they gather together with the church to make the decision. You talk to somebody in an American church, they go, oh, I had a big decision about what I needed to do. And you say, what'd you do? They'll go, oh, I went to the beach by myself, just was alone with God to talk. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a difference. And they understand this powerful truth that God speaks in community to his people. Look at what it says in Acts. Now, this is what the church is supposed to look like. All the believers, when they gathered, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that's the New Testament, to fellowship, sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, to prayer. There's a deep sense of awe that came over them. There's miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers met together in one place. They shared everything they had. Then going on, it says they worshiped together in the temple. They met in large groups. They met in homes, in small groups, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowships those who were being saved. The way that we experience the Holy Spirit guiding us and teaching us, the fourth way is through community. When we gather together in a large group and we worship God and we praise, I mean, God speaks to us. God's Spirit speaks to us. There's so many times that I've been gathered together in to get with the church and watching people worship, seeing God sing, I've seen people sing songs to God. I feel God's spirit teaching me and prompting me, leading me, uh, showing things me in my life that I need to. Times of confession. I mean, it is powerful when we worship together with the Lord and communion and there's miraculous signs. I mean, people's lives get changed. And when we get to see people stand and say, I believe when we gather as a church, we get to see the miracle of life change. And look at what it says in Acts 13. One day, as all the people, the men were gathered, worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work. He called two people out to be full-time pastors. And in my life, the way God called me to be a pastor, where I knew is I was in a church meeting with a lot of people. And I had a clear sense, God speaking to me, prompting me, nudging me, leading me and saying, this is what I want you to do with your life. And as I've talked to pastors and missionaries, that's where it happens. It happens when God's people gather together. God calls his people out from among them. And he says, I want you to go to all the world. I want you to preach the gospel. I want you to be a missionary. I want you to be a pastor. Whatever it is, God speaks uniquely as the church gathers in large groups and we worship and there's miracles and there's signs, he heals, he does all sorts of things. And then also in small groups. And when we meet in a small group, it's different. I mean, for over 40 years, I've been in a life group where what happens is we discuss God's word. You get to hear people interact with God's word and talk about how it's working in their life. We pray for each other and we get to see God healing and breaking strongholds. And there are all sorts of wonderful things that happen. And you know, we get hurt in community. We get hurt in relationship. And the only way that you really get healed is in relationship. And so being in a life group is where God provides the healing and the strength and the support that we need and the authenticity and the honesty that we live the kind of lives that we need to live. And so God speaks in powerful ways. He teaches and he guides in community as we meet in large groups and as we meet in small groups. And then the fifth way that God leads us is through circumstances. Colossians 4, 3 says, pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities. Last week, Jared talked about how God gives opportunities, kairos, these unique God-given opportunities. And God leads us by giving us these incredible opportunities. One of my favorite stories to illustrate this is from Tony Campolo, who was a Christian speaker uh, and writer. And he tells a story about how he was speaking at a Christian college. And when he got there, there were eight students that were gonna pray for him before he spoke. And so they laid hands on him. And so they began to pray. And he says, they pray these really long prayers. And then one guy didn't even pray for Tony or the, you know, the chapel service. He said, oh God. And he started praying for somebody named Charlie Stoltzowitz. And he says, oh Lord, you know, Charlie uh, Stoltzowitz who, uh, lives down in that silver trailer down this road, one mile on the right. And yeah, Tony Campolo is thinking, do you know who you're talking to? You're talking to God. You think God's up there going, no, wait, who, what's his name again? And could you give me that address? And what color is the trailer? And the guy goes, Lord, you know, you know, he told me that he was going to leave his wife and three kids. 
and that he was just going to walk out. And so God, you got to do something, save his family, save his family. And Tony's sitting there with eight people with their hands laid on him. He's thinking, I got to go speak at this chapel. This guy's praying for Charlie, who lives in a silver trailer, one mile down on the road, on the right, you know, and so he's doing it. So finally they stop praying for him. He speaks at the chapel service, he leaves and he heads home. He gets on the Pennsylvania Turnpike and uh, as he's heading home, he sees a hitchhiker on the side of the road. He doesn't normally pick up a hitchhiker, but he felt prompted, nudged, moved by the Holy Spirit to pick this guy up. So he picks him up and the guy gets in the car. They start driving down the road. Tony Campolo says, hi, my name's Tony Campolo. What's yours? The guy says, my name is Charlie Stoltzewitz. Without saying anything, the next turn off off the turnpike, Tony Campolo gets off and he turns around and he starts going the other direction. The guy, Charlie goes, hey, mister, where are you going? And he says, I'm taking you home. He says, why? Because you left your wife and three kids and they need you. And so he gets real quiet in the car and just kind of watching. And then he's absolutely shocked as Tony turns down his road, drives one mile down and stops on the right, right by the silver trailer. And Charlie goes, how do you know I live here? He goes, because God told me. And so they get out of the car. Charlie walks over and his wife comes running out of the trailer and the kids and she goes, oh, I'm so glad, Charlie, you're home, you're home. And he kind of looks at her mesmerized and she says, what's wrong? And he kind of whispers to her what had just happened. And so both of them with wide eyes look at Tony Campolo and Tony says, you two sit down because God's told me that I need to tell you some things. And so Tony tells them about God's wonderful kindness and love and about how Jesus came to save them and rescue them and can save and rescue their marriage. And beautifully, they both receive Jesus and believe in Jesus. And Tony spends time with this guy. And this guy grows. And over time, he grows more and more. And today, Charlie is a pastor in a church, which is amazing because God speaks to us, his Holy Spirit speaks to us through circumstances. And so we see God, Spirit clearly is a guide and he's a teacher. We see he guides and teaches us through his word. He teaches us through prayer, through the Holy Spirit, through community and through circumstances. But hearing God's Spirit is what's so critical. And it's something that we learn. We're not born with it. Paul, when he was on the road to Damascus and he heard God's voice for the first time, and Paul wrote, ends up writing most of the New Testament, he didn't recognize God's voice. He said, who are you? Samuel, who was a great prophet in the Old Testament, when he was a boy, God spoke to him and he didn't recognize God's voice as his spirit spoke to his spirit. And so it's something that we have to learn to do. If Paul needed to learn, Samuel needed to learn, we need to learn how to listen to God's spirit. So how are you going to listen to God's spirit? So I'm gonna tell you real quickly how I do it because look at what James says. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you all must be quick to listen. I mean, we're quick to talk to God when it's like, help me fix, fix them, fix this. But we've gotta be quick to listen. So what does it mean to look like to listen to God? So the way I learned to listen to God, to combine all this information, kind of put it in my life, is I ran into two pastors in my life that were way older than me when I was younger and their relationship with God was fresher. Their character was admirable. Uh, the way their minds thought was younger than even mine. And I was so attracted to their relationship with God. I said, what is it that you do? How do you, how do you relate to God? How do you have this friendship with God and experience God being a teacher and a guide? And so they shared it with me and I took some of their ideas and I put them together. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about this and doing it. So real quickly, I'm just gonna tell you, this is how I spend time with God and develop a relationship with God. Um, first of all, I, I, if I, have, I spend 30 minutes a day doing it. Now I know it's a long time, but if you're gonna spend some time, here's how you'd spend 30 minutes. I have a journal and what I do is I just do this. On the left side of the piece of the journal, I write yesterday and I just write down everything I did yesterday. All the things I did, people I met, conversations I had, feelings, perspectives, and stuff that is just going on in my life. And here's why I do it. What I feel like is as I'm writing that, I'm just inviting the Holy Spirit. You know how an NFL football team will watch films of the game after the game, and they're seeing what they did well, didn't do well? That's what I feel like happens. God 
spirit literally leans over and, is, and we watch my life and he's pointing out and he's saying, look at you did that really well or here's something or did you notice that? And here's what you need to know. And it surprises me every time. God's spirit is kinder, more gentle, more affirming, more inspiring. And it's not that he doesn't point out things that I do wrong, but usually it's like, you know what, next time, what would be a better way to handle that? But God's spirit is so kind and it is so exciting just to look at life. And I love, it's either Plato or Socrates says that an unexamined life is not worth living. And so what I do is I just look at my life in the past and the Holy Spirit is a guide and he teaches me and he's like a coach that just kind of gives me, you know, a sense of what I need to do in my life. And then at the bottom of the page, I just track emotional, spiritual, and physical. And I just rate myself uh, on a scale of one to 10. Then over here, I read God's word. So I read God's word every day for about 10 minutes. So I do this 10 minutes. 10 minutes in God's word, and what I do is I just write down observations, lessons, thoughts, things, anything that sort of jumps out to me, I write it down. Uh, and so I have a sense that God's speaking to me through his word. And then I pray, and I pray A-C-T-S, because if I don't, my prayer life is reduced to help me, fix me, fix them, it's too simplistic. So acts is adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. So adoration is just, God, you are, you are great, you are awesome, you are loving, you are kind, you are faithful. So I just where I see God working in my life, see is confession, I just clean the messes up in my life, where I admit them, I'm honest and I'm authentic. Thankfulness, I just write a list of 10 things for which I'm grateful for, which I rehearse during the day. And then ask means supplication, but it's really request, but ACTR doesn't spell anything. And so it's just, I write down the requests that I have for God, and then, uh, and then I just listen. And under listening, I just write down any, any sense that I have that God, I go, God, if you were gonna say something to me, what might it be? And I just write that down. That takes me 30 minutes. Now I know, you go, I don't have 30 minutes, it's okay. I can tell you what you should do in 15 minutes. So if you just have 15 minutes, here's what you do. You just read the Bible for seven minutes. You go, I don't even have time to read the Bible. All right, you're driving in your car, your phone will read the Bible to you with the Bible app. Just play it and just listen to God's word for seven minutes and just stop it and just in your mind rehearse. What did I hear you say, God? What did you do? Just repeat back what you heard. Amazing because it's God's word. And then just spend seven minutes praying and talking to God and telling him what is on your heart and you'll experience peace. Just those 15 minutes of the day, it'll change your life because what Jesus said is, behold, I stand at the door of your life and I want to have a relationship with you. All you've got to do is open the door. So here's my question to you. If you were going to spend any time with God, listening to him, being taught by him, when would it be? Be in the morning, afternoon, at night. What time? Okay. What place? Where would you do it? And then if you just got a few minutes, wouldn't you love to have a relationship with your heavenly father? That's a friendship. That's what the Holy Spirit wants for you. Pray with me. Father, we are so grateful that you love us. You call us your friends and you invite us to experience you as a friend. That's what we want more than anything. Thank you for that. In Jesus name, amen.
And love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind And mercy When all love is said in your hands and receive God's blessing. Father, look at your children. They love you. Would you bless them and keep them? Would you cause your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them? Would you lift up the light of your countenance? Would you show them you are a loving father? And God, would you grant them your peace? We ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in God's grace.